Welcome to Senate Education on this, at least in Southern Vermont, snowy day. We're so pleased to have President Garamella here from uh, the University of Vermont to talk to us uh, about things at the university as well as um, an overall introduction. Um, I don't remember how long, Senator Garamella, you have been at the university, but you will remind, I know your tenure has been brief thus far, but uh, we'll look forward to hearing a little bit about you, the university, COVID, how everything is going. Um, and then after that, uh, we are going to continue our tour of higher education. We will be hearing from the Select Committee on Higher Education, as well as others related to the state colleges. So um, with that, um, Mr. President, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Thank you so much, Senator Campion. Um, appreciate all of your time. Appreciate your asking me to come on. Congratulations to, I think all of you got reelected and certainly for the newer, for the new senators. Uh, I know Thomas worked um, hard at this and was very well received in, the, in, the, in our county. So uh, uh, happy to, you know, looking forward to working with you all. Um, I, I will uh, acknowledge that Wendy Koenig is here. She really knows everything there is to know and you should really be asking her questions. But anyway, um, she's, a, she's a great support, um, I think for the state and for the university and I'm, I'm glad she's on, um, but I'm pleased to make this presentation. And I see Dr. Pers uh, uh, Senator Pershlik is coming on too, which is great. I work with him on the, on the NEBI uh, efforts. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, um, to your point, I've been here about a year and a half, uh, Senator Campion. Um, I won't tell you how long it feels like I've been here. So, um, and, and I'm pleased that I talked to uh, Senator Hooker and others uh, relatively recently with the, with the changes in leadership and so on too. So um, this is just a start. I'm, I'm more than happy to come on anytime you'd like me to or answer questions. Um, I, I, I think what I find, I won't be pulling up any slides and such, um, what might be helpful, I hope you've all received uh, two sort of one-pagers. I speak in one-pagers if I can. Uh, I think it's easier to convey what you want to convey and keep it clear. Um, so I, you don't have to go through it. I, I'll just point to a couple of things, but we normally do a, a one-page summary of the University of Vermont. Um, some consider the University for Vermont, as I do. Um, and it, it sort of captures a few key uh, items which you know, I, I think it's good to keep handy as you think about us. Um, I'll just point out two or three things in that handout that uh, that has been shared with your committee. One is that, um, you know, almost half, 45% of Vermont students attend UVM uh, without paying any tuition at all. And then most of the rest have some form of financial aid. So this is important to us. We would like to continue that for sure and to the extent possible, grow that, make it more attractive for Vermonters to attend UVM. Um, and and the, besides educating the students, the big positive is that 30%, over 30% of our out-of-state students that come to UVM stay in the state and work. And 70% of Vermonters who come to UVM are employed in Vermont. So. I think especially at a time of these demographic challenges that you all know better than I do, high school student numbers going down, et cetera, it's, it's critical that the, the talent that the state needs um, you know, is importantly being fed by the University of Vermont, of which I'm very proud. Um, certainly we have, you know, a while back, an independent study showed that we have a one and a third billion impact on our state's economy. There's many ways in which we impact the state um, and we're proud to do so. Uh, we, our state appropriation, as you all know, has remained flat for a long time. Um, uh, the, the appropriations always gone to the same categories which are listed at the bottom of that sheet. The, the, the summary is that 75% of our state appropriation goes to financial support for Vermonters who attend UVM and 25% goes to our extension services that are assisting the state throughout, the, uh, throughout all counties. Um, and, and there's other stats in there. Uh, you're welcome to refer to them. I'm more than happy to answer any questions about them. But I will say before leaving this uh, one flyer that affordability is a very uh, high priority for me. And I think especially while we were 
going down this path and froze tuition uh, from my very first year, uh, I think the importance of that is, has been underlined by COVID. So many families are struggling and we would like to make it as easy as possible for them. Because of our small state support, it is uh, it's expensive to go to the University of Vermont, but we have now frozen tuition for a, for a third year. We've announced it for a third year. For, and for next year, we've also announced that our room and board will stay fixed. It's not going to be increased as it has for decades. And as in, it's been increased every, every year for decades and this year we're not going to be increasing it. Moreover, we'll be reducing our comprehensive fee by as much as we can, not a lot, but, but I think it's an important message to start bending the curve to the extent we can. So you will continue to see um, from me, but, uh, but I will say that the University of Vermont community cares about equity and fairness and um, affordability comes at the heart of that. Um, the, the second piece of information, which is perhaps much newer to all of you, is uh, this Office of Engagement that we have established at uh, UVM. So some of you may remember from our conversations that our strategic competitors plan, which is a two page, very sort of summary document that, that um, you know, identifies our focal areas for UVM, points out three things. One is our central focus on student success and student experience, internships for them, affordability, accessibility, all of that. The second piece is to double down and invest in our distinctive strengths. We're a small research university, not compared to UVM, I mean, not compared to Vermont, but compared to other ones. And so it's important that we identify what we're good at. And we have, um, I think everyone at UVM agrees that our strengths are in building healthy societies and a healthy environment, given our Lana College of Medicine, of course, but Rubenstein School of Environment, but even College of Arts and Sciences, every college at UVM contributes to a healthy environment and healthy societies. That's our second focal area, focal area. The third focal area is to engage better with our community, which can be defined any way you like, but certainly extends to all 14 counties in the state. Uh, and engage meaning be of service to make our significant resources and assets um, available to our, our you know, Vermonters this is not financial resources, it is our technical resources, it's our intellectual capital, and we can help in many ways. We have for many, many years, but I wanted to draw um, sort of a bow around it, make it easy for Vermonters to understand how to connect with the University of Vermont. And so we set up an office of engagement. Um, I, I thank you, I thank the, um, the legislature for helping us set up uh, I'm sorry, President uh, Garamel, one second. Uh, Mr. Kaplan? Yep, sorry. Like you to, uh, have you free my piano, so to mute yourself, thank you. I'm sorry. I hope, I, I hope you heard what I said, so I won't repeat anything I said. But um, so the state of Vermont, the you know, state house gave us uh, a couple million dollars last year out of the CRF funds to help set up this office of engagement. Thank you very much for that. And. Um, you should really, the way I, I explain the Office of Engagement is that it is the front door to the University of Vermont. It is really a state entity as far as I'm concerned. It is something that, this, that the state has helped set up at UVM so that the state can access UVM better and UVM can be of greater service to the state. And so um, I wanted to provide you a, a one pager on that as well. I, I do hope you've all received it. Any of you that have not, um, please let us know. You all know Wendy well, if not uh, directly me, uh, and she can she can be sure you all have it. So the reason I'm so wedded to and and think so highly of an office of engagement is that I started my administrative career in a university um, leading the office of engagement back in Indiana, and um, it was it was so clear to me that the entire state depended so heavily on the university and drew on us for so many things. And so um, uh, I, I think there is a lot of potential for the University of Vermont to be of service to the state, especially as we come out of COVID, especially as 
businesses, households, livelihoods are very strongly affected and in some cases destroyed by COVID. We want to be here to help. Um, and so the, the fact sheet about the Office of Engagement shows you just some of the um, key elements of what we're trying to do. I think it's a relatively novel um, idea for many in the state, and I hope that you will increasingly engage with our Office of Engagement and, and understand what we can do and help us uh, have a larger impact and, and uh, connect with the rest of the state. So some of the things I've pointed out in that one pager is that, um, so there's an economic development piece, right? We've got, um, the, the number on that, if you've got a, a sheet is incorrect, it's 35,000 alumni uh, from UVM work and live in the state. And so obviously that is a big economic development piece by itself, but um, there's, a, there's a fair amount of focus on entrepreneurship. We have helped just in the short time, just, uh, and to clarify, we've only been running up and running since September or so. So it's been about four months. And this is the outcome from those four months and we will be providing you regular updates. Um, we have helped companies write SBIR, STTR grants. These are federal grants to support their research and their efforts. And um, UVM has been at their side helping them uh, with writing these things because they have some pretty specific needs and, and we can do this. Um, as you know, we bring in about $185 million of federal research funds into the state every year. And so we can provide this kind of service. Um, there's a lot of um, community service by our students that I've listed there. Um, the community partners work with our faculty in service learning opportunities. And specifically for the public service space, we brought in about $23 million of research funds just the last year. Um, and uh, I think adult learners, uh, we've, we've been talking about it in the state quite a bit. Um, we have 2,500 or so adult learners that are engaged in our continuing and distance education. I'm hoping that we can continue to double down on it and grow it. But on the SBIR, it's a small business innovation research. Um, those kinds of grants, we have helped startups write proposals for these grants. Um, there's one in, for example, uh, there's a couple that have come out of UVM technology. One's called Benchmark Space Systems, another called, another's called Core Map. That's that's female-owned. Um, uh, one's about uh, sending small vehicles into space. The other's about atrial fibrillation uh, drivers. But we have a 14-county reach, and please remember that um, we don't forget it. There are many pieces of what we do that apply in every part of the state. Just to give you one example, um, you know, there was a study that we did on food insecurity during the pandemic and um, our vice president of research office funded it and the impact on Hardwick in the Northeast Kingdom uh, was written up in seven days. There was, uh, there was a very uh, nice write up about that kind of work and how it helps. So um, we have an advisory council that has representation from across the state. We're continuing to look at it and expand it so that every part of the state feels um, connected. And so while the CRF funds helped us set it up with the software systems needed, the staffing, et cetera, we have, I will, I will uh, mention that we're asking for a million dollar ongoing um, support for the Office of Engagement. And we will be sure to come back every time um, on a quarterly basis, as often as you like, to report on the metrics. We're tracking metrics quite carefully, and we'll, we'll show you the return on investment, which will be many, many times larger than the, the funding supported. So those are, you know, I think the Office of Engagement is a new concept for many, and I wanted to sort of spend a few minutes explaining that. Um, Senator Campion, you asked about our COVID experience. Let me say very proudly that uh, this is one thing where we are almost second to none. I believe we have among the best response in the nation of any uh, universities. We had an in-person college experience that we were committed to. We thought we would spare no expense, keep our students safe, our community safe, but also our jobs in, at UVM and in the community um, protected, which I believe we've been able to do. And um, you know, we, we adopted among the most aggressive testing protocols Every student coming to UVM 
tested before they came uh, to, to the city. And if they were positive, they did not come. So we kept COVID away. We tested them on day zero, day seven, on every week throughout the semester. You might hear about other universities testing, especially large universities in other states. They all test some subset of uh, the students. We tested every single student every week. So we had about 150,000 tests in the fall semester with less than 100 students testing positive. I think this is just a record I'm so proud of because our students did the right thing. They behaved, they signed our green and gold pledge. They took it seriously. They wanted to stay here in person and behave incredibly responsibly. Our staff did an amazing job. And of course, our faculty had to pivot to new kinds of teaching, remote, hybrid, and all these kinds of things. And I'm just very proud of our community for doing that. Our strategy for the spring start, for the spring semester, will be very much the same. We'll pretest um, all students before they come. And then um, the, the point is we only bring healthy students, as in people without COVID, to this city. And then we continue to monitor them throughout. So I mean, I've said to Mayor Weinberger and others that it's far more likely that our students will pick up COVID from the community than that our students give COVID to the community. And it's been true. It's, it's not an idle boast. And I'm very proud of that. Um, I will say here more than even with anything else that I'm deeply grateful to the State House for their support through CRF funds for UVM to, to uh, address the, the COVID challenge. Um, our expenses will come out to exceed by a lot the support we got from the state, but still the nearly $30 million we got, um, we spent primarily towards additional costs of financial aid uh, a, a, a good fraction of it, about a third of it, went to financial aid that was in, on top of what students were getting. COVID testing was very, very expensive, and we were able to pay for that with, um, with the state Sierra funds. Technology, hardware and software in classrooms for um, supporting remote learning for those students who are at home, et cetera, additional staff to support instruction, equipment and supplies, disinfecting, deep cleaning, um, additional compensation leave and unemployment for our, our staff. Um, so all of this was, uh, we couldn't have done it without that. So I, I thank you for that. And you know I, I, I think we're just beginning to learn what the next COVID relief package looks like and we will be discussing that again. Um, the last thing, Senator Campion, I appreciate the time you gave me and I'm happy to answer questions, but I wanted to address also not simply COVID, I wanted to say that COVID has not cowed us. We're, we're not defeated by COVID. It's not the only thing we're doing. Um, we have continued, and it was very important to us to continue uh, the strategic work focused on the future. And so it was actually in the middle of COVID in April, right? COVID kind of came on in March. In April, we released our strategic plan. It's called Amplifying Our Impact. As I said, it's a two page, very punchy document. We um, have uh, uh, embarked now uh, in, in a process that, uh, in fact, Senator Chittenden, but others in the Senate have now helped us expand. There's a good number of faculty helping us with what we're calling academic reorganization. Um, we're looking at our organization and saying, is this the best, most streamlined, most simplified organization for students and parents who are looking at UVM? Is this the best way we can align ourselves are we offering the programs and courses, et cetera, that students are most interested in looking into the future? So that's an academic reorganization effort that, I'm, that I think is very exciting and energizing. And um, it's kicked off. We're going to have a lot of sub, you know, work groups, et cetera, um, work around that. Um, we're also going through the flip side of that, which is there's a university-wide um, uh, diligence and care in looking at those uh, majors and minors that have extremely low enrollment, typically two to five, that we think we cannot afford anymore. We then want to reinvest that money into programs that have more um, uh, demand and interest from students. And so we're going through that process. We're also going through a very intentional process of achieving what we call R1 status. Um, so Vermont, as you all know, University of Vermont is a mighty 
research organization, especially with Elcom and, and all the rest of the work we do here. Um, but we, the, the highest level of ranking by the Carnegie uh, classification is R1. We're currently at R2. It takes very specific things to go to R1 and we're focusing on that. Um, our research funding grew by 25% last year. It's currently about 180 million plus. We will continue to grow that continue to grow our profile, our scholarship, our impact on the community, but also the nation at large. And finally, the last thing I'll say is, in addition to all this diligence, we've also um, launched what we call our SOAR initiative. It's a student financial aid initiative. That's my top fundraising priority. So um, to all of our alumni and friends who care a lot about UVM and our future, I have made it quite clear that our one top priority is to support our students. And therefore I've said, please give in terms of financial aid so that we can support our students. So we've launched that. I'm hoping it'll move forward. There is a piece to it that is meant to serve underserved students, pe people of color certainly, but also those that uh, whose economic situation is such that they never consider UVM. I would like for all of those students um, to be able to consider UVM as a viable option for them. So we will be trying our best to raise some funds, private funds in that space as well. So with that, I, I hope I didn't go too long, Senator Campion. I'll stop with that and I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah, that, that, was, that was very helpful, I appreciate it. Uh, committee, uh, questions from committee members. Uh, Senator Persley and then Senator Shindon. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. President, on the engagement center, I got an email through my other job about that, and there were some open houses, but they were all during the uh, legislative day. I wondered if you guys have thought about maybe having some specifically for legislators, because I, I think that would be helpful. It's a fantastic idea. So the couple of things we have done is, you know, I've, I've, I'm working with Wendy to try and distribute this one pager. We're also, we've got a newsletter that's going out and I believe every legislator is on it, but sometimes these things go to spam. So I'll, you know, please please reach out if it's not um, reached to you. But uh, Senator Perschlick, this is a great idea. Uh, as you know, we do a day for legislators once, uh, uh, once a year. Um, we focused on LCOM actually last year, the, the Co College of Medicine last year was very, quite successful, but um, happy to do this. In fact, I think in ordinary times, we would come out and meet with people and, and do a reception or something at the state house. But um, I'll work with Wendy and Chris Kaliba, who is with our um, uh, CDA Department of Community Development and Applied Economics, who's, the, who's directing that effort very uh, you know, um, successfully. And he and I and Wendy will work on a plan. And in fact, if you don't mind, we'll reach out to you for uh, ideas for how best to reach the group that um, that that might be interested and benefit from learning about it. Very happy to do that. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Senator Chittenden. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here, President Garamella. Um, my question is uh, somewhat leading. Um, I, would, uh, I would say that Dr. Linda Olson, Olson from the Castleton University just recently communicated to me that they have the faculty assembly has narrowly approved the elimination of their geology major. And I know in a recent announcement at the University of Vermont, uh, that it's been proposed to also terminate the geology department. I also see in this communication from Chris Kaliba that just came out yesterday that you also just referenced, and I think you spoke to it in your remarks, that we want this Office of Engagement for UVM to be the front door where we can strengthen the connection of UVM to communities all over the state. I was quoting the email there. My question to you, and this is something I've been talking about for years, anybody that will have a conversation with me, is how do you see possibilities between the University of Vermont and the Vermont State Colleges? As a Vermonter and now a Vermont State Senator of the Green Mountain State, I would love to make sure that we keep and retain the expertise and knowledge of geology here in the state. And I'm wondering if there's ways to have our, organ our institutions create rope lines and bridges between the Vermont State Colleges and the University of Vermont to mutually support each other and to meet the, the needs of the higher education uh, of the landscape of, of Vermont, the Green Mountain State. Do you have thoughts on how we can strengthen our geological offerings by working closer with the Vermont State Colleges and bridging through our continuing ed and distance learning opportunities that have become so apparent to us in this uh, pandemic to bridge UVM to further more corners of the state? Great question, Senator Shouldn't. And I think there are at least two parts to your question. 
I will say that well, you might think it's an exaggeration, but I'll say that no one's more committed to the success of VSC at UVM than me. Um, I have, from the time I arrived, one of the first meetings I took was with Chancellor Spalding at that time. Joyce Judy has become a close friend now, Pat Moulton, um, Chancellor Zadatni, et cetera. So, um, and, and even the other piece of it, you know, VSAC with Scott Giles, et cetera. So it's very important um, uh, that we think of the higher ed spectrum in the state as one spectrum. It's not us versus them. You know, we all need to, to, to prosper for the state to have the higher education it needs. Um, we serve very different uh, clientele, if you will, different pieces of the puzzle. There are some duplications among um, entities within the VSC, but also with, uh, with UVM. And I think the more streamlined it can be uh, where uh, right, we figure out the needs of the state and try to address them, especially VSC, because most of their students are um, in state. And so I have been focused on this ever since I arrived. Um, Wendy, I will ask you if you don't mind after the meeting or, or at some point um, to share this one document. It's a two page document. Um, I, I, I faked it as a one pager, but it's got two sides. Um, so it's, uh, it lists the educational pathways between UVM and VSC. We were very deliberate about it. I believe when I first came, I asked what the pathways were, and I think there were nine programs. Um, I said, why can't we do 25? And we got to 25 with it at the end, by the end of my first year. But um, we basically extended them to, we said, can we not do it for all programs? And CCV has been the most active in um, engaging with those on pathways. VTC has some, I believe with Castleton, we have something in nursing. I don't know every detail, but we, I, wanna, I wanna share with this committee in particular, our educational pathways between UVM and the VSC system. So that's one sort of piece of your question. Um, as, you, as you know, I think I'm, I'm also um, honored to serve on the VSC study committee and have been helping to the extent I can. And um, you know, the problems that VSC is facing or the challenges it's facing are, are quite different from those uh, of UVM. I mean, our, our clientele is quite different. So many of our students at UVM come from out of state. So the same solutions don't apply to everyone, but I uh, am committed to helping in any way I can. And, um, uh, and, and I'll say that we are at UVM, as you know, uh, Senator Chittenden, uh, we want to avoid getting into the kinds of situations that you know, three or four other schools in Vermont have gotten where they had to shut down, et cetera. And so the kinds of diligence we're going through at, at UVM are very much um, targeted at uh, securing a financial and, and, and successful, you know, sustainable future for UVM. To your point specifically about geology, um, a couple of quick points. As you know, uh, when we, you know, majors and minors are very different from courses. We, first, we have assured all the students that are in these majors and minors that they will be able to see through, we will see them through their program. So no student will lose their major or minor once they're registered. Most courses in these spaces will continue to be offered. Um, it is that the major or minor, and I don't know the geology number offhand, but for the majors and minors we're looking at, the enrollment, the, the graduation has been less than five students at a time. And so, um, as, and and the, the, the encouraging thing is that geology in particular has been very active since um, this discussion has started. And they're working with how they can collaborate with geography or anthropology or other colleges, et cetera, where they, they can be a strengthening of that resource so that we can continue that work. Um, our geology department is quite active with research, um, small setups, number of faculty, but very research active. And I intend entirely to support those. So I think it's the start of a conversation. Dean Falls of the College of Arts and Sciences is going through this very deliberately in a very collaborative way with the um, chairs and departments. Um, I will say that it's about 120 students out of 4,650 that are affected by these majors and minors in um, 
in CAS. And also after this change, if we go through all the changes we plan, we had we had considered, there'll be 44 majors remaining and 52 remaining minors in arts and sciences. So I think we'll have a lot of options, but we'll need to work through the specific question about where geology lands, where's the best um, synergy, if you will, in terms of them working together. But I believe that that department in particular has some very strong faculty and they'll land very well and um, essentially lead to a stronger offering than, than even they have now. Senator Shin, did you have a follow up? So my, my concern is I thought I was under the impression it was proposed to terminate the geology department. And that just, to me, I'm, I'm concerned that we will not have the expertise in house. And so that's where I lead the question towards ways to extend our course offerings to the Vermont State Colleges, similar to what we've done with CDE, with Z sections in the past, with distance education students. I would love to imagine a world where we are strengthening those articulation agreements and, and rope lines between the Vermont State Colleges. So if they have students that really want to take geology classes, that they, the VSCs don't have to stand up the program themselves, but instead the University of Vermont could have a redundant as the flagship institution geological offerings so that we can extend our, our expertise throughout every corner of the state. But that's just a follow-up comment. I see Senator Lyons has a question. Thank you again for being here, President Garamella. Of course, and point taken, just a quick, quick uh, follow-up. So um, we will take it back. And um, I don't believe anything is happening to the faculty in geology. I think they'll probably, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of very small departments, which are not very sustainable the way they are. So if we can have a, a larger sort of a conglomerate that can offer much more of these things, um, that's great. I don't actually know Castleton's uh, offerings in the space well, but we will take that back and I'll bring it to uh, Dean Falls. Thank you, um, Senator Shigman. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you and thank you very much, uh, President Garamelli. Um, it's been really terrific listening to all the things you have to say, the plans for the future and the, how, how much you've accomplished in such a short time. Really appreciate that. Um, I did have a question about geology, but I think that Senator Chittenden has pretty much covered it. I, I would make one comment about that, however, and that is when I chaired the Senate uh, Natural Resources and Energy Committee, we had a wonderful <coughs> state, state geologist and uh, someone who, uh, a deputy uh, commissioner who worked with him, who is now your faculty member. Um, the issue is um, mapping groundwater. And that really did fall to the geologists within the state. I think that is a neat link for us, especially given our concerns around water quality um, and so on. So that's just not, probably not uh, a big deal, but uh, my other concern, I guess, um, it's not really a concern, but I'm really happy to hear about your interest in connecting and linking with the VSC. And in particular, our state for the past several years has seen a, a, a significant need for social workers, masters of social work, um, nursing at every level, uh, APRN, BSN, LPN, uh, but the linkages that are made between UVM and other institutions are so significant. And I, um, I, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about what, if any, additional uh, seats <laughs> might be opened up in some of these programs. I know we're missing faculty and nursing, uh, unavoidable. But I, I think certainly, I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't have capacity in the social work environment. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Senator Lyons, thank you very much. Thank you for your long service uh, representing our county. I appreciate that and your warm remarks. Um, so by, uh, for sure, you know, I, I think that uh, once uh, Wendy's able to get you the the short summary we have of the um, relationships, the partnerships we've built with VSC that um, will answer a piece of your question. And, and I will say that's not the end, that's a start. We are open. If there are stronger pathways, it, it, we need to understand um, what, uh, what VSC needs and what they can offer, what we need, what we can offer, et cetera. I will say I'm quite proud that um, our nursing program did expand. I think it doubled 
in in just uh, relatively recent, maybe two years ago or so, it was it was something that Provost Prelock now, who was uh, dean of nursing, um, brought about. And I've asked her shamelessly, what will it take to double again? <laughs> so I said, if you could go from 70 something to 140, why not 140 to 280? Um, turns out that the biggest challenge there is placements, clinical placements. We don't have a lot of opportunities in the state. They're, they're saturated. And so working that out apparently is problematic. I don't know a lot of details about it, but that's the issue. Um, because we certainly have no dearth of applications in nursing. We could admit many more and still keep up our, you know, still only be getting top students. So there is that. Um, I'm we're very proud of our social work. Uh, I mean, SAS is a great college. I know Dean Thomas is very committed to this. Um, I will, I'll admit to not knowing a lot about, again, the potential for a collaboration with the different, you know, with Johnson or and, and, and NVU or Castleton or um, CCV and VTC, but we can certainly uh, uh, look into that further and get back to you. Take a look at our one, you know, our short summary. And um, I believe you have Joyce Judy coming back uh, on the line here after uh, me. And I think she will uh, attest to the fact that anytime they have come to us with suggestions I have said yes, if, if it's a doable thing. So the door is open. And I think that the more we work together, the more we um, avoid duplication, there's no need to duplicate. We're, we're too small a state to do that, uh, the, the better. So I will look into any um, opportunities in the social work area, but also what challenges they may, they may have been. So let me look into that further. Thank you. Additional questions, committee, before we uh, move on. President Garamella, thank you very much. Uh, great having you. I did make a mistake uh, prior to your starting and by not introducing Wendy. For those of you in the building, uh, please know uh, President Garamella does not have the, the pleasure of spending every day with us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Until he runs for office, uh, but uh, Wendy does, uh, or we actually uh, have the pleasure of working with Wendy. Wendy, for a range of questions, issues, constituent uh, concerns, is an uh, incredible, incredible resource uh, of knowledge and uh, access to, to the university. So thank you, Wendy, for being here, and we all look forward to uh, continuing our work with with you this session. Thank you for having me and happy to help anytime. She's one of the most competent people in the state I know. So actually make use of it, give uh, her things to do and she'll do them within within an hour. That's uh, her specialty. So yes, she's an amazing source of support. And honestly, she can sometimes find you answers faster than I may know answers. So that's not to say that I, I'm, I'm, I'm directing all of you to her by all means direct your questions to me too and I'll be happy to answer directly or come back on the committee or so. But, but Senator Campion, I, uh, you actually had promoted me before and made me a Senator too. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that and, uh, and no thank you for that. I think yeah. I'm um, an academic and I've been a professor for 30 plus years and will continue to be one till the, <laughs> till the day I you know, have to hang up my hat. So thank you. Well, thank you for being with us. And uh, I appreciate Senator Perchlick working with you a little bit in terms of setting up some kind of open house that we can all participate in perhaps one evening or, or what, whatever works for best for people. So, so we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you all very much and uh, have a good day. Thank you. And I'm gonna hang up. I mean, I'm gonna get off the call. I, you can continue, I think, wait, so thank you. Great, thank you. Terrific. So we have a uh, committee, we have uh, folks that will now be uh, led into the waiting room. From the waiting room, we are going to move on to the select committee on public higher education, which uh, I feel we kind of in some way kicked off with our conversation with um, President Garamella. And we have, uh, if you do not have the report uh, in front of you, uh, it is on our website, on our webpage. Um, if you've not had an opportunity to look at it, I would encourage you to, to do so. 
But today we're, we have with us uh, uh, Joyce Judy, uh, who was, I believe, uh, President Judy, you were one of the co-chairs. Is that accurate? Um, I was the chair. You were the chair. <laughs> Thank you. Not not by uh, <laughs> not by request. Uh huh. I yes. see. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you coming back, uh, and I believe Senator Baruth uh, is also uh, going to be joining us, uh, Chair Emeritus of this committee, uh, and uh, Mr. Prescott. We've not had the the opportunity nor the pleasure to meet, uh, and we're delighted that you're here and. Uh, we'll, I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself when uh, the time comes and you can let us know your roles and your responsibilities as it relates to this group. Um, so let's give it uh, just another minute uh, to see if Senator Bruth is gonna join us. If anybody needs to stretch, uh, it's a good time to do so. That's a good question, Chair Campion. Absolutely. So I have the December 4th report, which I understand was an interim report. The final report has not yet come out. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. We just refer to you as Chair Emeritus of this <laughs> committee. It's not official. It's an amendment going into the appropriation. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, so... So we, we're, we're just, I, I, we are just, uh, we've said a quick hello to Brian Prescott as well as to uh, uh, Joyce Judy. And we will start right now. I don't know how best actually from the three of you, you would like to do this. If Philip, you have introductory comments um, as, the, as the chair, the former chair uh, that you'd like to say, and then we could, possibly turn it over next then to President uh, Judy and then Mr. Prescott. I, I, if, I may, if I may, uh, President Judy and, and Brian, um, I think we should go in order of uh, proximity to the work that went into the document. So I'm, I'm a member of the select committee, uh, but President Judy is uh, chair of the, uh, of the committee and also on the steering group, and then Brian drafted. So I'll, I'll just offer some, some general remarks if I can. I, I just want to, um, to start by saying um, I'm, I'm really delighted to see this committee uh, picking this up so quickly. And appropriations has also gotten into the work of the select committee. I think it's, a, it's an absolutely pressing issue in front of the legislature. And if, if I could, I just want to take the senators on the committee back to the meeting we were having. I think we were in a caucus meeting and uh, Senator Westman read us uh, an email that he had gotten from Jeb Spaulding's office indicating that there were three closures to be expected of the different campuses. And that touched off uh, a frenzy, really, tripartisan outrage um, that those three campuses would be closed, uh, finger pointing all around, you know, uh, everybody involved. Um, and one of the things that I tried at that point to make clear is that uh, that finger should um, focus on us, um, possibly more than anyone else, given that in the 80s, we were um, supposed to be supplying uh, a substantial portion, I believe is the language and statute of the state college's budget, and we have never lived up to that commitment. So um, I, I begin there as a way of saying that the select committee was born out of uh, frustration with and, and horror over the idea that the, the Northeast Kingdom might lose its last institute of higher ed uh, and that a place like Randolph Center might lose uh, a job engine for that area of the state. So the select committee was formed up and we hired NCHEMS um, and I will just say up front that their work has been exemplary, um, very 
rapid, nimble, but also far reaching in terms of stakeholder engagement. Um, and I think the select committee, President Judy has done a wonderful job um, moving things along there. So in the space of a very short number of weeks, we've come up with a plan and I will, I will just hit the, the top notes. And that is that under this plan, no campus would be fully closed. Although as um, Brian will lay out, it does call for the shrinking of the physical footprint uh, of one or more campuses with those details to be worked out by the Board of Trustees. Um, the other thing that I wanna um, not sugarcoat is that this calls for increased funding from the legislature, not in a bridge sense. And in one way, I think that was an unfortunate choice of words because it indicates that you're gonna bridge funding and then you're gonna go back to the old uh, the old normal. And what this report calls for is bridge funding to a new normal that requires the legislature to be funding the state colleges at a, at a more significant level. And toward that end, it suggests that it would be ideal to have a designated funding stream. It doesn't talk about what that funding stream might look like, but it envisions the the, the typical infusion of $40 million or so. And then on top of that, another, um, another chunk, uh, 25, 30 million over that. And so uh, I, I will just end that piece of what I'm saying by, by acknowledging that there are people out there who wanted, I think, the select committee to magically find a way that we could actually save money and keep all of the, the campuses that were threatened with closure. That is impossible. And I think the select committee um, very quickly, uh, unanimously signed on to that idea. We will need as a state to be funding those, um, those systems. And then the, the other top note is unifying them into one system of governance other than CCV, which would remain on its own. Um, and in so doing, we would keep those job engines where they're in operation in the state, but we would also be um, you know, committing to a higher level of contribution as a state. And the last thing I'll say before I um, turn it over to President Judy is we, we have, um, to a certain extent, I would argue, embarrassed ourselves among New England states by how little we have contributed to the state college system. We've made um, getting a degree from a state college uh, almost the most expensive undertaking in the country. Um, I think there's one state where you can spend more to get a, a, a state degree, but uh, it is no mystery, therefore, that we have fantastic K through 12 graduation rates and relatively abysmal take up um, of people going on for higher degrees. It's, it's, I think, very much a question of affordability. So with those things said, um, I will turn it over to President Judy and then uh, I guess to Brian for the a walkthrough of the report. Great, thanks Senator Bruce. President Judy, thanks for uh, coming back this week. Well, and thank you very much. Thank you, um, Senator Campion, for the opportunity. I just want to um, begin by acknowledging that, you know, on this committee as chair of this, I come to this wearing three different hats. So when I talk, but today my hat is as chair of the select committee for this, because as you know, I'm also a member of the Vermont State Colleges and I'm president of the Community College of Vermont, but I feel like I've been able to compartmentalize this work. Um, it has been a challenging um, professional opportunity, I will say, to sort of help um, move this forward. But I, I want to begin by just acknowledging I've been, I, you know, a part of a lot of legislative committees, and um, I just really want to acknowledge and thank Senator Baruth and Representative Kathleen James for their involvement in this committee. They have been very active. They have been very engaged and, um, and it's made a difference. And so um, 
I just feel like they aren't, they are incredibly strong um, participants. And this is why like we, like when I've been asked to, to come and talk um, about the committee's work, it's so important to have Senator Bruce and, and Representative James with us because they are such key members of this committee. So on behalf of the committee, I wanna thank Senator Bruce, but I just wanna to acknowledge to his colleagues and peers that, that they have been very engaged and it has made, it has made an incredible difference. Um, and so thank you for that. I also um, want to echo the, the sentiments of Senator Baruth about um, NCHIMS and its National Center for, the, for Higher Education Management Systems. Um, as you all know, um, the legislature put together um, um, this um, proposal, uh, this request. And um, in the request, they asked that we um, hire a consult, consulting firm to help guide this work. And um, the Joint Fiscal Office um, put together a request for proposals long before the, the committee was formed. And um, we had a lot of proposals and the Joint Fiscal Office has really um, been a partner in this in terms of, of helping to direct that work. They actually negotiated the contract with NCHEMS. And I have to say that um, it's been um, my pleasure to work with NCHEMS. And I think one of the most important things that they bring to this work is an outside perspective. Now they don't understand Vermont, you know, people will say they don't understand Vermont, they don't understand the culture, they don't, but it is, it is an, we need to remember that it's an outside perspective. They're looking at things. I think, I think this report will give us the guardrails with which to move forward. And so I, I think it's, I think it was wise on the part of, of the uh, legislature to ask for a consulting group because it's just simply, Sometimes it's nice to have someone from the outside looking in. It's not that it's the be all end all and they have all the answers, but they do come to it without the baggage that we all have in Vermont. Um, and so I just, um, I think that this has been an interesting process. I also want to um, echo what Senator Bruce said. We began this work in September and it has been um, a rapid fire. Um, we produced, and Senator Chittenden, you asked about the reports. Um, the first report was due in December. So we had, we brought NCHEMS on in September, produced the first report in December. The second draft, so the initial report was in December. The, the second draft will be due on um, February 12th. And the third draft, the third and final draft is early April. And I don't have that date. Um, stuck in my head, but I bet Brian Prescott does. And so I think that um, the first draft was giving the high points. Um, and then the second and third drafts are really taking some of the points that we had sort of set aside and refining those in ways. And um, I think the other piece that I want to acknowledge is um, all of our sessions have been pub open to the public. So we've had a lot of public comment. We also um, have engaged, the New England Board of Higher Education has been a great partner in helping us with this work. They have convened a lot of focus groups, several focus groups early on, and they're doing three more focus groups um, to get feedback on this particular um, draft of this report. So I guess my message is, I think that one of the things that has been important to the select committee is to make sure that as we go along, we are getting um, public input. I think the hard part is sometimes people will say, well, we provided input, but they, did, we, they didn't, it didn't, it wasn't reflected in the report. I think that what we have to do is we wanna hear a lot and then NCHEMS takes all that information back and tries to look at the data um, and figure out how to move us forward. I think that the, the, la the final thing I will say before turning over to, to Brian, has been that, um, you know, we oftentimes talk about that, you know, we need to have data informed decisions. And this is what's helpful about bringing in an outside consultant because that's what they have is they have data. They can collect their data. They don't bring the emotional um, baggage that all of us do to, to some of this work. So I think that what I'd ask is to, is to hear from them with an open mind in terms of after they look at the data, after they do their analysis, here's what they, what they best propose. And um, 
So with that, I will turn it over to Brian to sort of walk through and, and highlight some of that. And then um, I'm happy to answer questions at the end, provide a, a perspective or whatever. And I'm sure Senator Bruce would be happy to do the same. So with that. Um, Actually, I will have to go back to my okay. other committee. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But uh, we know where to reach you. Yeah, okay. that's, right. that's what I was going to say. You know where to reach him. So with that, I will turn this over to um, uh, Brian Prescott, who is the lead consultant for us um, from NCHEMS. And Brian, maybe you can give also a little introduction, background about yourself and, and how you got to be such an expert in the field of higher education. Sure. Um, thanks, President Judy and Senator Baruth and uh, the rest of the committee for the opportunity to speak to you. I routinely have some difficulty being heard in my household and on Zoom especially. Um, can you all hear me pretty well? Okay, good. Um, all right, so by way of introduction, I'm, I'm Brian Prescott. I'm Vice President at the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, or better known as NCHIMS. Um, NCHIMS is a private nonprofit 501c3 organization in Boulder, Colorado, where we've uh, worked for 50 years trying to bring uh, data-informed decision-making to post-secondary uh, policy-making and institutional leadership um, and practice. Um, in the course of that time, not all of which is, it, it encompasses my tenure there, um, we, um, we've worked in every state at one point or another, and lately we've been involved in a number of states doing strategic engagements like this one, and sometimes in states where the conditions are not dissimilar to what Vermont is experiencing, like Pennsylvania, Connecticut, um, some of these other ones. And so it's been our pleasure to try to help the select committee uh, sift through uh, a lot of data uh, that we've provided some of and that they've, they've, they know well themselves. Um, I would, uh, um, and, and to produce the reports. Uh, like um, President Judy said, uh, we would produce a report that I'm mostly going to talk about this afternoon. Uh, on December 4th, we've since been making some um, adjustments and refinements to it. We have another report due on February 12th, and the final report is due on April 16th. Um, I would echo uh, as well some of uh, President Judy's comments um, around uh, not knowing Vermont very well. We, we feel like we've gotten to know Vermont uh, pretty well, but normally in engagements like this, we will get on a plane and come to the state and spend a great deal of time there. Unfortunately for everybody, we aren't able to do that uh, this time. So we've been grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to take advantage of technology to do our best uh, version of that. Um, briefly, I wanna talk for just as briefly as I can to sort of provide an outline for this. And then um, I'll be interested in your questions, but uh, real quickly on the process, um, we uh, collect a lot of data. In fact, we were the uh, original source at NCHIMS for the federal government post-secondary data system uh, back in the 70s. Um, so we're used to data and have a long history with it. We pulled a bunch of data. We've uh, engaged with stakeholders uh, all over the state. Um, we've been very grateful uh, for NEBI's assistance in that regard. We have reviewed the, the numerous reports and studies that have come out about the Vermont State College system, including particularly the treasurer's report, Jim Page's report, the reports of the Labor Task Force, VC, VSCS Thrive, and um, NVU Strong. Um, and, but a great deal of our effort has been around working intensively with the select committee to develop these recommendations, which were forwarded to the legislature in December uh, with the consensus of the select committee. So we were pretty pleased with that. Um, as I make my way towards talking about the three major recommendations that are in that report, I would say that our review of the data and of the discussions that we've had with the stakeholders leads to some conclusions about the state of the Vermont State Colleges that probably will come as no surprise. Um, first and foremost, transformation of the state college system is critical and it's urgent. Uh, a, the, the, the CARES Act and particularly the, the bridge money that was provided uh, has helped um, uh, delay some very difficult decisions and, and created space for the select committee to operate. But in the absence of further action, 
um, some of the uh, recommendations that were put forward by former Chancellor Spalding um, are certainly within the realm of possibility. And so the need to, um, to really wrestle this uh, challenge to the ground is, is very urgent indeed. And to do so, it's gonna require some additional state support. Uh, that's in part due to the fact that um, the Vermont, uh, Vermont is the least relative to the state appropriations in Vermont, public institutions get more of their money from tuition revenue than in any other state in the country. And it's actually not even close. Typically it's either Vermont or New Hampshire, but the most recent data suggests that Vermont gets about 87 or 88% of public institutional revenue from tuition uh, and with the remainder, remainder coming from the state appropriation. Um, and that would have been fiscal 19 data. So it's pretty su significant and it leaves um, the Vermont State Colleges uh, vulnerable to the kind of demographic challenges that can be foreseen in Vermont and in New England. Um, the select committee, uh, before, it, before we took up the, the recommendations, um, spent a considerable amount of time thinking about the criteria and the charge that, that the legislature gave it uh, and, and established some criteria for the kind of solutions that would be needed. Um, they included that uh, criteria for student learners as well as for the state. And among them, include, I'm not gonna read them off to you there in the report, but they include the, that the state college system become more student-centered, that improvements be made in affordability, that there is, access to workforce relevant programs for all types of students, especially adult learners and throughout the state geographically. Uh, that the, that the, the solutions have to lead to a um, uh, conditions that are fiscally stable, sustainable for the system. And that increasing, in order to do that, there will increasingly need to be uh, greater coordination and collaboration across the system in both the academic delivery of programs and the um, administrative functions associated with running uh, a state college system. So with those criteria in mind, the select, select committee made three recommendations in the December report. When we uh, had this conversation with the uh, um, Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Campion, um, the chair stopped me after the first one to ask answer questions. And I don't know if you want to do that, but I would be happy to talk about each, each of them separately or all at once. Um, sure. I think, uh, why don't we, why don't we take them one at a time? Okay. Thank you. Um, the first one is uh, to re restructure the Vermont State College system. I'm going to consult my copy, of dog your copy of this report to make sure, uh, you know, any details that you might ask me about, I'm able to answer without having to hunt for it too much. But <clears throat> This is, um, in some respects, the, uh, the biggest set of changes that would be required for the state college system. But um, we, the, the select committee, ultimately, after, after taking a look at, um, at the current structure, made some, some uh, recommendations that the, um, that the state college system reduce in size to a system of two institutions, the Community College of Vermont as a separate one and a combined institution that unifies Northern Vermont University, uh, Castleton U University and um, Vermont Technical College in one, under one single uh, leadership and one accreditation system. And that the, uh, that, that restructuring would be, uh, is, is designed to better uh, address the needs of the state and the students by sharing academic programs and administrative activities across uh, the unified institution. Uh, it assures that, or it has a better chance of assuring that there will continue to be a physical presence in the, in the locations where it currently exists. Single accreditation and a single leadership will smooth pathways for students between the existing locations and will allow authority to be uh, focused in a way that will ensure the, um, better ensure the, the uh, combination and the collaboration of, of academic delivery across institutions. Community College of Vermont has a mission that is somewhat unique and certainly a business model that, that is unique. And so we, um, we put forward the idea that keeping that institution separate um, makes uh, sense for the, for the student needs and for the state as well. 
Um, in addition, we do uh, we did make the recommendation that there remain a chancellor's office. Um, the chancellor's office's role and responsibility would be we do not expect that the chancellor's office that this would require the chancellor's office to grow. What we think the chancellor's office's uh, role should be is much more around policy leadership, engaging with uh, the other parts of state government, including the University of Vermont, the Agency on Commerce and Community Development, and the Department of Labor to ensure that uh, programs that cross all those boundaries are well, as well as uh, uh, the K-12 system, that those programs are, are, are well designed and aligned. Uh, we uh, think that ensure it, that it's also there to ensure the uh, collaboration across CCV and transfer of credits of students in attending CCV to the other institution. Uh, but we are assuming that the administrative activities that are necessary don't necessarily all have to be housed within the chancellor's office under that arrangement. And rather to the degree that that uh, that it's possible the policy relevant or the policy leadership function of the chancellor's office be preserved and maintained for the purpose of the system as a whole. So that was a that's a quick overview of that recommendation and um, I'll pause and see if there are questions. Committee, Senator Lyons, please. Okay, good. Um, yes, thank you. And I haven't read the whole report, and, but so I'm going through it while you're going through it. But do you ha have you done any uh, fiscal analysis for some of the changes that you're recommend recommending? I mean, so how much it'll cost and or, or how much we can either save or reinvest in um, the new organization or in CCV. So that's kind of the the fiscal analysis. Yes, uh, good question. I think that, that there is a, um, a recommendation specifically related to the investment the state needs to make, but we expect that each of the, with the exception of CCV, each of the remaining three institutions uh, is expense, has a high expenses relative to their enrollment and compared to their peers. Um, and if we combine, if, if there's a combination of the three institutions, we think that there is a savings of up to, at, a, at, a, at the maximum level, based on data that are a couple of years old, but it's the most recent we can get for comparable institutions, would be something on the order of $40 million. We think it's more realistic that, in, that savings or reinvestment opportunities probably are closer to $20 million, but they come from better uh, coordinating the delivery of academic programs and reductions in the uh, employee complement, as well as carrying costs associated with facilities that are no longer being used to their most efficient uh, uh, usage rate. Of course, um, <laughs> when these things happen, it's so infrequently infrequent that we uh, see actual savings. Um, somehow they are subsumed by new needs. So it'll be interesting to see how that all sugars off. Um, I don't really have another question at this point uh, that I, I do think it's, did you at all look at, and I, I, I look at uh, maybe uh, President Judy or, or you, or Brian, did you look at uh, CCV as an integrated entity within the system, or did you simply decide up front based on administrative um, issues that it was best left alone? How, I mean, so I'm just trying to understand how that decision was made. Right. So uh, I'll take the first stab at it. And, and, and... And as is often the case in our select committee meetings, if uh, uh, President Judy or if my colleagues who are not with me today have corrections, they will chime in. But when we did, when we um, crafted the recommendation for the select committee to consider on this uh, restructuring issue, we looked at um, a variety of different options for how to array the assets of the state um, in the Vermont State Colleges, including a combination of all four institutions uh, a keeping all of them separate and combining Castleton and NVU, leaving Vermont Tech as a separate entity along with CCB. 
ultimately we, we, we came to the um, recommendation that we did because CCV is an institution that operates so fundamentally differently from the other three. Um, and it, uh, it serves a mission that is somewhat unique at the sub-baccalaureate level. Um, the, 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 the toughest nut in this restructuring recommendation to crack for us is around the somewhat unique and unusual nature of Vermont Tech, um, having a considerable amount of sub-baccalaureate technically oriented programs along with some relatively integrated baccalaureate degree programs. And um, Vermont Tech is an institution that we think uh, could be organized under the, the larger uh, unified institution, but with a clear mission to carry on its technical uh, activities as part of that larger institution and to help um, some of the other, some of those programs be available to students um, attending on campus at Castleton or via uh, shared programs and online delivery and so forth. So, so was there any consideration given to um, establishing the CCV administrative and other model parts of the academic model within uh, other institutions? I, I, I understand that you're recommending some new administrative uh, pieces. Uh, did you, will there be an opportunity to evaluate the benefit of moving toward a CCV model since it is so successful? And given that one of the recommendations is for workforce development and getting graduates into jobs. So, so you know, it seems to me that some of the more basic sciences or other areas would be left aside for the more applied areas. And I'm just wondering, huh? <laughs> I'm sure you had a lot of discussion about this, but I, I'm just curious whether you looked at the CCV model as something to be uh, accessed and utilized in other, uh, in, in the other institutions. And, I, and I'll stop there. I, I think it's fair to say that there are, there are things that the other institutions can learn from CCV, as well as there are things that can be learned by CCV from the other institutions in certain areas. But the business models are so radically different on a number of levels that it didn't make sense to, it doesn't make sense to think of them as being easily uh, melded together. The most important distinct, distinctions are around the nature of the uh, employment agreements between CCV and its primarily adjunct faculty and the other institutions with collectively bargained full-time faculty, as well as the resi residential nature of what is being provided by uh, Castle to Northern Vermont to a lesser extent BTC uh, with a, a suite of student services and student activities that generally uh, are not um, as widely available at CCD. Um, so uh, there are, I think, on the administrative side, ways in which there's combinations that could create greater efficiencies across the entire system. But in terms of trying to adapt a specific type of business model at CCV to what's, going, what's, what's historically been the case and what's currently the case at the other three institutions uh, can only go so far given those very distinct differences. Uh, Senator Hooker and then Senator Chittenden, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think my question has been answered, although I don't quite understand it fully, um, and what the advantages and disadvantages would be to incorporating CCV within the whole system. So um, perhaps after reading the report a little more thoroughly, I'll understand that a little better, but I do am getting the impression that you know the models are different, um, they perhaps wouldn't meld well, but I'm wondering if the pros might not outweigh the cons in some cases and would perhaps like to hear more about that later on. Thank you. Uh, Senator Chinden. Thank you, Dr. Prescott. Uh, my question really has to do with a comparison and your vantage point, I'm guessing you can compare to other states. Uh, I look to the State University System of New York where I see 64 institutions. Some of them are community colleges. Some of them are including Cornell. Cornell has some schools within its institution as well as all the SUNY campuses that we're so familiar with. 
So I, I believe they've uh, come to the similar realization that you're putting forward in this draft notion that there are economies of scale to be achieved. And I completely take Senator Lyons's point that even when you make those savings, you don't always see it on the bottom line. But what I will say is when you reinvest in the institution, I see much more sustainable, thriving institutions that aren't coming back to the legislature for more money year after year after year. So hopefully it's still moving in the right direction. So my question to you, uh, Dr. Prescott, is... <clears throat> Looking at CCV, VHS, uh, the Vermont State College system, or any potential new merger of the three, and also this institution called the University of Vermont, what additional back office efficiencies do you have you seen in other states that we should definitely look at while maintaining or moving forward in this trajectory, but still somehow bridging some of our competencies across our institutions to reduce those redundancies to achieve better outcomes with the same amount of resources? I don't know if I made my question clear enough, but I'd love to hear how you think CCV can still uh, leverage some of the resources, the systems, the capabilities uh, that the VSC system might invest in? And similarly, how does UVM mer not merge, but also uh, let build off of those, those uh, capabilities? I see that President Judy has her hand raised. Yeah, I just, I, I think um, we're bleeding over into recommendation two, um, which is about the administrative um, recommendations. And so I think what I might suggest is that Brian, you go on to, um, if it's okay, um, uh, Senator Campion, that he talk about, um, the coordinating the administrative service operations because a lot of what's included in the recommendation too is coming up with questions there the questions that are being asked right now are will be can be answered with recommendation too so if that um if that's okay yeah, sure. with that's everyone i think i'd ask brian to to does talk about um the second recommendation great does anybody have any questions regarding uh, recommendation one before we move on Seeing none, uh, please go ahead, Mr. Prescott. Sure, um, I think that the, the second one is relatively straightforward and not, not controversial by and large. I think virtually every report we've seen has uh, come to the conclusion that more efficiency in the administrative services area um, are needed for Vermont State Colleges. Uh, right now, there are a number of activities that are done campus by campus that could be coordinated in a way that makes sense uh, and, ser and services may in fact be improved in some cases. So these are, these are areas that are, that are not directly touching on the academic enterprise, but stuff like procurement, uh, some of these actually are steps that are already being taken by the chancellor's office around the audit and budgeting and accounting tech functions, facilities management. But then there are programs uh, and, and activities related to um, that are a little bit closer to the mission, like financial aid, in which right now each of the institutions sort of has their own financial aid policy, their own approach to, to distributing aid. And we think that the state college system could create uh, the sort of the policy infrastructure under which financial aid it, uh, offices are um, actually carrying out the business of meeting with students and ensuring their packaging is working for them at the campus level, meeting with individual students. So that's, a, that's, a, that's the kind of way in which we're talking about that coordination. And equally uh, around institutional research and effectiveness. Um, I would say too though, and this is a, something that I, I have a sense from a distance uh, that um, is misunderstood about the December 4th report, at least a little bit, which is to say that, the, that we are not advocating for a larger chancellor's office necessarily in this report. We are advocating for the identification of where competencies currently exist, uh, either at Linden or Johnson or, or Castleton, um, that can be leveraged from the perspective of organizational models that ensure that the kinds of sort of standard policies that would, that would, that would help create these efficiencies are created within the, where the, that locus of competency exists and then implementation is carried out where the students or the employees are, are most needed. So that's kind of what we have in mind around that. Um, I would simply just add, if, to go back to Senator Chinda's question just a little bit, one of the things that we are making this, we, are, we were putting forward these recommendations uh, around is to ensure that there remains a critical mass of uh, competency, whether it's for administrative functions or academic disciplinary areas or student services to best meet the needs of students throughout the state in ways that may not be possible if the state continues to allow 
a where the system continues to allow a much more institution by institution by institution approach to some of these challenges. So the sharing of academic programs uh, more effectively means that students attending uh, campus in Linden who are interested in um, programs that for which the faculty numbers have shrunk at Linden can still make can still get uh, the kind of broad array of disciplinary perspectives in an area um, by taking courses offered by faculty at Castleton and at Randolph or wherever they happen to be within the system. And I think that there are opportunities to sort of build on that and expand that uh, in partnership with UVM. And I furthermore think that there are uh, innovations in the delivery and of, of academic programming, including online, and the recognition of credit that uh, an institution by institution approach will not serve students well and will not be efficient. Senator Chinden, does that answer your question at this point or do you have a follow-up? Uh, Dr. Prescott, I, I don't know if you, in your uh, re recollection of the report, we would speak at all to how at the end where you speak to opportunities for UVM and the BSC system to also further collaborate, but I'd, I'd love to see in the next iteration of this report expansions upon those things. I understand economies of scale, which is the thrust of the first and second recommendation. I'm just wondering why we would not want to at least further explore, at least to exhaust the opportunities to achieve those economies of scale across the other publicly funded institution that I work at, that I'm an employee of and very proud to be a alumni of the University of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Prescott, one of the things I'm wondering is, can you tell a lot of what you've written is about access, uh, access to higher education. I, I'm trying to get a sense of access in a way to what? What will the offerings be? You know, we agree or disagree with what the University of Vermont just went through uh, in terms of of sort of an examination of their academic programs. I work at an institution that has also gone through this kind of a, of a process uh, in its history. I suspect others have as well. How and when will we, will the institutions look at themselves and, and ask the questions about what are we offering? What is being offered? Do we need certain majors? Do we not need certain majors? That sort of thing. That's a great question, and it, it, uh, I need to be a little bit careful because um, we want to be sure that as consultants to the select committee, well, we aren't trying to take the select committee in places where the select committee is not most uh, ideally suited to go, and where, where in fact the, the, likely, the best place for those conversations to really sort of be settled is perhaps at the Vermont State College Board and Chancellor's Office in the institutions in consultation with the faculty. We have, however, in the report, argued that there is in Vermont, relative to other states, uh, a heavy emphasis on baccalaureate level education and for traditional age students. And we um, have made the argument to the select committee that the, uh, the, the community college in Vermont in particular, as well as um, the other institutions should uh, seek to expand its activities with respect to the adult learners in the state who are currently under uh, underskilled for the, the needs of the future, um, particularly in a state that's likely to see a demographic decline among traditionally aged college students uh, and where there is a, a clear need. Uh, we also made, um, made reference to the need for better integrated workforce skills programming within existing uh, programming. So for instance, a case in point is take an English major, ensure that as part of their graduation requirements, they have some courses and, and, and activities related to technical writing, uh, or uh, an increased focus on experiential learning activities. Uh, we also, and to sort of, I'm bouncing around a little bit, but also related to adult learners, trying to think of uh, and, and, and address ways in which those students might be better able to um, take advantage of of programs at times and in places and in means that best that they can that best fit their schedules in their lives. So uh, we understand the board um, and the chancellor's office has initiated a set of conversations around um, duplicated program offerings. Uh, and those are fraught conversations with the faculty. But the best place I think for those those particular issues to get resolved 
is with the board, with the board's recognition that there is an expectation that the academic programs be shared, that there is a structure under which that happens and so forth. Thank you, Senator Perchlick. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Prescott, my question is around the three presidents. If, if we merge the, those three institutes, institutions and you maintain the chancellor's office, what is the thinking with the three president's offices? And would that just be part of the chancellor's office or would you also have a president's office? Um, if you merge the, the three institutions, you would be effectively having one president, one chief academic officer, one chief uh, uh, operating officer, CFO type uh, individual. So some of the savings that you would, you would be able to um, count either for actual savings or reinvestment opportunities would come from reducing the administrative overhead on that front. Uh, not for me to say which president or, or whatever uh, uh, emerges from that, but um, that is part of the idea. And I think buried in our, uh, in the recommendations, in the report anyway, I think Senator um, Baruth re referenced this is the need to um, address the degree to which the Vermont State Colleges have too much physical infrastructure. But it's also the case that there needs to be uh, a look at the degree to which there's an employee complement that's larger than what's necessary to serve the population of students that is currently served serving as well. And one way to one way to deal with that is to start uh, trying to reduce the, the level of uh, administrative overhead there is there is and then in addition there will be um, looks across the, the system for opportunities to save in that regard. And does the report get into where the like the, the president could be at any of the three institutions or they could be merged with the offices of the chancellor or you don't get into that kind of level of detail no i no we don't all right thank you other questions so this question may be actually uh teeing you up a bit for the the third section uh but i'll i'll ask it now you know it seems as though a lot of this is uh you know, the success is banking on a solid admissions program in a way. And what I'm concerned about is looking historically at the state colleges. A lot of our students came from upstate New York, which now has practically free tuition or is moving in that direction with Hudson Valley Community College and trying rigorously to lower state tuition. And then New Hampshire, which has has this institution uh, called the University, I think it's uh, Southern New Hampshire at Manchester, which again is just exploding and is keeping all of its students. So if that's the situation, you know, how are we going to compete when wealthier states can actually keep their tuition so low that we're not gonna be pulling from these areas? That's a terrific question uh, and um... The answer to that question has to begin with the fact that uh, I referenced it earlier. So much of the institutional uh, health, fiscal health, is based on tuition revenue because of the relative underinvestment of state resources in these institutions. That it's the it's a question that demands it has to be asked. And um, as we as we look ahead, uh, there are a few things to to recognize. One is that innovative models like SNU um, are a reality and they're growing. It's really, I think, unlikely that underfunded small institutions with declining enrollments uh, like the Vermont State Colleges are gonna be able to innovate without figuring out a way to develop the kind of economies of scale that give them some freedom of movement. So that's one. Two is uh, it's, essential to recognize that the students that Vermont State Colleges are serving now are different from the students that um, the U University of Vermont serves, uh, both within the state and in nearby states. Uh, certainly they don't, BSC institutions don't, don't, aren't able to recruit as heavily from out of state as UVM does, but they also are the only place that students 
in the Northeast Kingdom are likely to go in great numbers. Uh, and so they, they, they serve a role that is highly valuable to, if the goal of the legislature is to ensure that opportunity is spread widely uh, to, a, to a high quality education experience. And so the question is, how do you, how do you ensure that they are positioned uh, to, to be um, able to sort of uh, uh, evolve and, and in competition and to meet the needs of the students. And that requires reaching, delivering programs of, of relevance and quality to students from the populations they serve, as well as to students that have currently not been served very well over uh, the recent past. And in, in Vermont's case, that's uh, relatively low income students. Mm -hmm. As Senator Bruth mentioned at the outset, college going rate uh, in Vermont is not anywhere near as high as you might expect given the uh, general uh, uh, value placed on education, but also those adult learners as well. So oh, that's helpful. And, I, and I, I, your point's a good one that the demographics, demographics have changed. I, I do still worry that our students, uh, some will uh, take their dollars and go to spots where the tuition is perhaps going to even be cheaper than uh, the state colleges. They will go to the humane system, they'll go to the SUNYs um, and to, you know, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. So it's still a concern of mine, but I, I appreciate uh, you pointing out that things certainly have changed and that the state colleges are going to have to amend, if you will, to, to, to the changing populations. Uh, Senator Lyons, please. So I keep bouncing back and forth between all the different recommendations. <laughs> this, is, this is really great. And I appreciate all the work that you have done. It's, it, it's really uh, a lot. And thank you. Um, the kind of, I have a couple of questions. And one on funding is, have you, have you gotten to a place where you're talking about shared endowment? I mean, so some, some of the institutions we're talking about have uh, endowment and some do not. And are we looking at um, sharing at least some of those private funds, I guess we'd call them, um, across, the, across the group of colleges as they work together? And so that's one question. And then as you're talking about innovation, I guess for me, the biggest piece for innovation is lowering barriers. So the whole application process to take the next step. I know CCV has worked really well at doing that with UVM uh, and others. So that's one barrier to lower, but the, the other barriers are allowing the courses that are, are at one institution to be consistent and shared with courses at other institutions. You know, the whole question about, did my course in economics actually satisfy the requirement over there? Um, so, but that, I mean, that's not a financial question, but it, it certainly can be for the students. Um, and then I'll just, I'll just stop there for now. But I, you know, I, I think about Castleton College, uh, excuse me, university, and how it really uh, jumped out. It, it made a huge step forward and, and reinvented itself. And part of that was a result of some very strong optimism, you know, very positive attitude that came from the university itself. And I wanna know how much of that was because it was on the way to Killington. I don't know all the kids who wanted to ski, but um, so my, but my, my fiscal question, of course, is around the, the funding piece and then maybe some attention to barriers that you've identified. Sure. Um, so let me, if I could for just a moment, make one more uh, amendment to my response to Senator Campion's question about the Vermont State Colleges and their value, because I should have mentioned this at the outset. We don't have very good data on the degree to which student residents of Vermont are graduates from the Vermont State Colleges recently. What we do know is that generally the case is that if students leave the state, they're less likely to come back. And then students who, uh, who come to the state are more likely to stay and contribute to the economy. Um, resident students who stay in state 
are the most likely to be part of the state's workforce in the future. And the Vermont State Colleges gets more of their students from Vermont than the other institutions do. And to the extent that we're able to look at it, it would appear as though that large numbers of, the, of Vermont State graduates, uh, Vermont State System graduates, are located in, are continue to be located in Vermont after graduating than other institutions. So bear that in mind as you think about the flow of students and the market for uh, student mobility and where students from Vermont might go or where they might come to Vermont from. So thank you, I apologize for that, Senator Lyons. Um, I think that the answer to the endowment question is one that we haven't looked a great deal at just yet, but I do think that and if, I'm, if I'm mistaken, President Judy will sort me out, but it, the Vermont State College system is a single entity. Uh, I don't know the degree to which it, it has uh, uh, an endowment set aside, but these are institutions of the type that generally are, they, they do not, they're not now, nor are they likely to be uh, leaders in, in the ability to attract charitable donations over the long term. That being said, I think it's fair to say that there, the McClure Foundation and some of the investments that have been recently announced at NVU are signs that there is an appetite to serve uh, to, for private philanthropy to, to, to engage with the Vermont State Colleges. And uh, we also think as part of the retooling of the, uh, of the academic program offerings that outreach and engagement with the employer community has some potential as well. But ultimately, I think that the way that in which, and we're not recommending a, a change in the, in the single entity structure of the system. And so the, the endowment would be, uh, uh, any endowment would be something that would be um, shared among the institutions that are there. And I'm not sure if I answered all of the questions that you raised. Uh, so if there's- uh, a, if, uh, You probably can't answer the questions about the kids wanting to go to Killington, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm just thinking about what are, what's, been the, what's been the big help for Castleton. And you know, part of it is so much of what the institution has done for itself and the positive attitude that's come out of that whole area. But then I said, gotta be skiing has to have something to do with it. Who knows? Uh, I, I, I can't speak much to that. I, I, there are some things that we, that we do look at as potential issues. Castle, one of the things that Castleton has done is it's um, discounted its tuition rate the most among the Vermont State Colleges. That is helpful in, in, in uh, at least in the short term in attracting students from elsewhere. Also, it's right across the border from, from New York. And as you've mentioned, there are people who do like to ski as I'm well aware of here out here in Vermont. Can I, can I circle back to the endowment question really quickly? And I know it's probably uh, more of a conversation and Wendy would probably be very upset by this, but certainly any coordinated efforts with UVM where UVM does have a significant endowment and how would that at all play out? And so that, that's a very long conversation, but um, as articulation occurs from UVM and our VSCs, uh, colleges and CCV, I mean, we're all in this together. We've heard that, so it might be it would be an interesting conversation. I wouldn't suggest that's something that has to happen, but maybe in the future. Senator Chin, did you have a question? Yeah, I would just say, Senator Lyons, I'm, only, I'm going to be a barking dog or a broken record on these things. I just see lots of opportunities for UVM and VSC to, to help support each other. I, I know at UVM, we just spent a lot of money on this click management software to manage grants and the marginal cost to extend that competency and that capability to the Vermont State Colleges would be so small. So I, I, I really appreciate that question. Wendy, I, I know it was directed at you if you wanted to speak. Of course, Chair Campion, I, I just wanted to chime in because I love talking about UVM and VSC and ways for them to collaborate. My apologies. Uh, Wendy, did you have something? Well, I, I, Thomas or Senator Shinden, I, I think that I agree with you about um, the the software and, and finding more opportunities. And um, President Judy will recall that a couple of summers ago, UVM and the VSC did a study together on um, potential for um, back end function collaboration. And I think we can continue to have conversations about that and do more. 
um, on those issues. And um, I agree that the endowment uh, conversation is, is a much more complicated and longer question, but I'll just remind folks um, for, for the sake of understanding that almost all endowment is restricted. So at least the endowment that we currently have um, would probably not be able to benefit the Vermont State Colleges based on the donor restrictions that go along with it. So, um, but, I, but I'm sure that at a future point, we can dive into that um, in, in a more significant way. Dr. Prescott, I'm wondering, and I, I hate to even ask this question with Senator Terenzini listening, but uh, was everything on the table? In other words, football programs, for example, you know, one can say, what is the, you know, what is the goal of a, an institution of higher education? And I think an argument could be made uh, that certain athletic programs might not, not be part of that mission, unless you're teaching maybe physical education or something like that. And, uh, but I am asking seriously, were, were these kinds of programs uh, looked at and examined in terms of their costs uh, when you were putting together this final report? So no, we did not look at the, the particular costs of say Castleton's football program. Um, we do think that, uh, and I think I might've just drafted some language somewhere today, that nobody's yet seen. Um, not making a recommendation, but, but arguing that uh, that's an issue, that is a particular issue, that residence halls is a particular issue, right. um, that, that the Vermont State College Board will, will need to look at as potential avenues for, um, for uh, addressing some of the cost issues it faces. Athletics is a particularly sensitive matter because it's so much a part of the brand identity of some of these institutions. And one of the pieces of feedback we've heard um, is the con is concern that uh, the combined institution would would lose those elements of brand identity that are important to recruitment from each of those places, and that that's that's a concern that I think is legitimate. It's also not surprising, um, and we and, and I think that there are there are uh, there are discussions and ways to to address that. But I, I think it's a it's a real question that the uh, that the board will have to to raise an answer about whether or not it can sustain in, I haven't gotten to the third recommendation yet, but in terms of it's part of the bargain, the Vermont State Colleges have to, have to collectively have to reduce a pretty substantial budgetary gap and how they go about that may involve uh, some decisions about what kinds of programs are offered, including athletic programs. Yeah, and uh, I, I, was asked, I also realize that, and I want Senator Terenzini to weigh in here, uh, and put me in my place. Uh, I do think that you know, with Castleton, there is indeed, you know, it's a recruitment tool. It it is, you know, it's. I suspect it's a big part of the community as well. But I was just wondering, in general, are these kinds of things, uh, you know, on the table? Uh, please, Senator Terenzini. Uh, thank you, Senator Campion. Uh, I, you know, I made the joke earlier to Senator Chittenden about uh, football at UVM, at, at partially out of my love for the sport, but but truthfully, you look at. To, to comment maybe to Senator Lyons, you look at some of the things over the last decade that Castleton has been able to do um, with adding a football program and building a stadium and modernizing dorms and adding facilities and programs. Um, they took Castleton College and made it into a place uh, by changing the name to Castleton University, which I think helped attract uh, more people. Uh, President, Former President Dave Walk was a, a visionary for that campus. And I think through his leadership, that made a big difference. So I think a lot of things happened uh, at the right time for Castleton um, under under President Walk's uh, leadership. Um, and I don't I don't argue that you know we are Castleton's twenty minutes from Killington, and you know the, it, Rutland is well one time was the second biggest city in Vermont and attracted um, could attract people. And now we have the downtown Castleton campus and downtown Rutland on Merchants Row. So I think a lot of things have happened positively at Castleton that maybe some of what they've done here could translate to, to the other state colleges throughout uh, throughout Vermont. So yeah, thank you for that, Senator uh, Terenzini. Uh, it is, it would be interesting to see, you know, in particular, how Castleton was able to do this. I mean, you go down, I mean, you have the arts, you have, you know, I think they've added a lot to the downtown community. And therefore, there's this reciprocal relationship, students benefit from that. Um, you know, 
being downtown and, and being able to engage with the community and the arts, et cetera. Um, any other questions? I know that we have a three o'clock stop uh, and I am, uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, Dr. Prescott, I was wondering what kind of discussion there was with regard to financial aid um, at the, you know, for students at the state colleges and how the state handles that. Uh, we, uh, we, we have done uh, uh, some work around affordability. Um, it did not make its way in, in full into the December report, but it is, on, is in discussions these days with the select committee. Um, there are a couple of different forms of financial aid. Of course, there's the financial aid that comes from the federal government. We're not specifically talking about that. The, the financial aid that comes from the state through VSAC to Vermont residents and institutional aid. And institutional aid and, and state aid work together with the federal aid to, to um, address uh, affordability gaps for low income students. And, but institutional aid is a particularly important strategic tool for uh, recruitment. And it is, I think, part of the reason that Castleton is um, being successful. They have doubled their discount percentage just in the last four or five fiscal years. Uh, that is the conversations uh, throughout the country uh, around discount rates um, is creating a, a lot of alarm as to how sustainable that actually is going forward. Uh, and so we have had some conversations about the degree to which financial aid um, decision-making is um, uh, addressed by the by the system as opposed to individual institutions. Senator Hooker, did you have a follow-up? Um, I think we'll probably discuss more as we go on, but as far as um, aid that's given to students that can be taken out of state, um, was that considered? <sighs> that, that, we certainly are aware that that is a, an issue. Uh, for some, at, well, there's a, our sense of, of that is that there are uh, strong champions on either side of whether or not Vermont residents ought to be able to take Vermont state taxpayer dollars in the form of grant aid to institutions outside of Vermont. We have not tried to tackle that particular thing with the select committee yet. Uh, one thing I will say about that topic is it's uh, two things I say. One is unusual for states to behave that way in the country. Um, the other thing I'd say is that um, the, the issue of, of VSAC aid portability um, isn't going to be the thing that determines whether or not the Vermont State Colleges are able to achieve fiscal fit sustainability as a matter on its own. Uh, and so uh, to the degree the select committee's charge was to, was first and foremost focused on achieving fiscal sustainability for the Vermont State Colleges. We, as consultants, been trying to help encourage that. Uh, to the degree that VSAC aid portability is uh, a possible part of the solution, uh, I think that that is a conversation yet to be fully engaged with the select committee. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, please, Senator Pershley. Just a quick comment on the portability, Dr. Prescott, you said it's rare. Is it true it's like we are the only state or one of only two states that allow portability of tax dollars out of the state? Off the top of my head, the District of Columbia allows that to happen. And I think that Rhode Island has some provisions related to that. And other than that, I can't think of any. Okay, so one of two states in a province. Okay. Or you mean the District of Columbia, not the, not the BC. Okay, thanks. Yes. Okay, seeing no other questions. Uh, Dr. Prescott, uh, President Judy, thank you both very, very much. This has given us, I think, a lot to think about. Um, we'll certainly be having you back and uh, monitoring also. I know you're having conversations in other committees uh, as well. Uh, Dr. Prescott, would you remind us, when is the next report uh, due and just what, what we might expect in that? So uh, 
we're still working on what exactly will go into that, but if, okay. uh, uh, but it's due on February 12th. Um, we have a select committee meeting on February 8th, where hopefully they will be ready to bless the, uh, the changes that we will make. Um, changes that we make will, uh, you'll probably see some, some stuff around it. the affordability conversation that got tabled for the last report. Um, there are some elements related to engaging the workforce uh, system more intentionally that might make their way into this uh, new document. And there are elements in, there's a, the, the, two more things. The basics, the beginnings of a, uh, of, of a set of implementation tasks for various uh, parties within the state. That includes the legislature, the governor's office, the board, um, and so on. We begun drafting what some of those things will look like. Um, and then the other thing is, and I, I'm surprised nobody has chastised me for this yet, but the report, as you know, the whole front end is still relatively outliney. We need to sort of flesh some of that stuff out. I want to thank you for your, um, as we've worked very hard over a short period of time to put that report together, we didn't, we felt like putting the recommendations on paper made more made a pri more priority sense than, than, than writing out uh, a lot of the, the intro pieces. So we're gonna try to have some of that more fleshed out. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing uh, no other additional questions, we will recess uh, until just a few minutes before 3.15 so we can get uh, continue this conversation. We have uh, with us uh, Professor Helen Mango, and I believe uh, Professor Mango is at, at Castleton in the sciences. Um, and she and her colleagues are members of the Labor Task Force uh, for Public Higher Education in Vermont. And uh, Senator Hooker was kind enough to set up this visit. So at three, you know, hopefully we can get a right at 3.15 start so uh, we can have enough time with them uh, as well as questions. Uh, as folks will recall, we do have end today a little before four because of chair's uh, meeting. So with that, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Prescott, uh, President Judy, thank everyone for their questions. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone a few minutes before 3.15. Committee members, please uh, remember YouTube is still going during the break. So you'll want to mute and turn off uh, your videos. Thank you. Wonderful. Seeing that it's 3.15, uh, everyone had a nice break. We will uh, continue our conversation uh, around uh, public higher education in Vermont. Uh, Senator Hooker wrote to me and put me in contact with Professor Mango, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor Mango. And I know uh, she has colleagues with her that may uh, or may not want to say something, but I'll let uh, Professor Mango uh, navigate that Prior to turning uh, the reins over to you, though, I'm wondering, uh, Senator Hooker, is there anything that you'd like to say uh, in particular? Well, I was I went to one of the um, informationals that the group had uh, asked us to attend, and I found that you know it does they do give a different perspective, and I think that it's important for us to hear the perspective of other people who are involved in what will be a, a pretty sizable change, I think, in what's going to happen with our Vermont State College system. But knowing that we all want it want to come out of this stronger and more resilient, uh, I think that it's important for us to hear from all parties. With that, uh, Professor Mango, if you would like to just uh, introduce yourself, um, as well as tell us about the organization that you are part of, and then uh, take it from there. Okay, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate this opportunity to speak to you today. And I'm very grateful to Senator Hooker for making the connection. So uh, thank you. We, um, I have been teaching geology and chemistry at Castleton for almost 30 years. And it's interesting that geology has been a topic of conversation this afternoon. Um, 
Uh, I have a presentation, a, a slideshow that we've put together and that uh, talks a little bit about our background. So I think I will go into that right now. And certainly if any of you have any questions during the this, this slideshow, uh, please let me know or um, at the end and, and hopefully I or one of my colleagues will be able to answer all your questions. So um, let me share my screen here and go into our presentation. So um, our, our group is called the Labor Task Force for Public Higher, Higher Education in Vermont. And we have been working since April on this design for unified public access higher education system. So the background to our group is that uh, soon after the uh, la uh, previous chancellor's recommendation to close the three campuses was rejected, uh, members of the collective bargaining units came together to organize this labor task force. And we came together um, because uh, the faculty and staff are the student facing people in the system. And we work with the students every day. We know their stories. Uh, we know the challenges that they face. And uh, we also know how to gather data and how to analyze it. And so we believe that we could find a better way forward than just closing campuses. Um, and this would be one that would benefit our students. It would benefit the state of Vermont and it would move the system forward in a sustainable and uh, logical way. So, um, this uh, gives us a, um, uh, a chronology, and I, I should have asked, you can all see my slideshow, yes? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so this gives the chronology of what has happened since then. So we've held town hall meetings to get input. We presented preliminary proposal to the VSC Board of Trustees um, and to the faculty and staff by the end of the summer. So we started work in April and we, met, we have met weekly ever since then. Uh, we have a two page brief that we shared with uh, some legislators and the select committee uh, um, and the office of the chancellor. And then our full report was completed and shared with faculty, staff and the chancellor on the 20th. And um, I've included it in the materials that uh, Jeannie asked me to include for this meeting. So you should have access to that. And we have contacted uh, like Senator Hooker uh, senators and representatives from the regions uh, that are represented by our campuses, um, and we have sent them the um, report as well. So the conversations with the members of the community led us to identify design principles, and we use those to establish goals. And throughout the entire process, we were looking at the issues of cost, quality, and access. So let's start with the cost goals. And these include enabling students to graduate low debt or no debt. So lowering tuition and making it the, the state college system more affordable is a primary goal. We uh, include reducing the expense of administrative operations to levels of peer institutions. We are top heavy in administration for a system of our, our size. We have about 12,000 students in the system and there are systems that are five times bigger that have uh, one executive uh, uh, group rather than the number that we have. Uh, and we um, main wish to maintain multiple campuses to support the regional economic vibrancy. We know how important our campuses are for the communities where they, are, where they exist. Our access goals include preserving campus, uh, the current campuses as hubs for local educational and student life opportunities, all the wonderful things that come with having the campuses and to deliver, uh, design flexible delivery formats in a variety of different kinds of learning. We also wish to expand workforce development op um, options in a variety of ways as well. Our quality goals include fostering collaboration across the campuses. We need better communication and we need better collaboration 
uh, one thing that we have learned on our committee is how well we can work together across the campuses and we wish to do more of that. Um, another goal is to design interdisciplinary programs that are practical and meaningful. And we wish to form partnerships or, or increase the number of partnerships that we have with local organizations, in, in other words, to integrate applied learning better. So we've come up with some recommendations. And the first of these is to reduce tuition. And that involves increasing the state appropriation. You've heard a lot about this, and this is certainly something that we have in common with the NCHEMS report, is that um, the, the, ve the very statute that created the Vermont State College system promised that the VSC shall be supported in whole or in substantial part with state funds. And as has been pointed out already since the 1980s, the state appropriation has been reduced dramatically from 51% down to its current 17.5% of the VSC budget. We currently rank 49th out of 50th for state support for public higher education. And over half of our college bound students go out of state for college. And another important aspect is there's been a lot of discussion about demographics. One thing which is important to realize is that 40% of our high school graduates do not immediately go on to college and high tuition is a direct link to uh, reduced enrollment. That the higher tuition means that fewer students can afford to come to our colleges. Our second recommendation is reconsidering the distribution of public funds that goes out of state. This has also come up in previous discussions this afternoon. So we recommend that um, we stop uh, with the unrestricted VSAC portability, which has diverted millions of tax dollars annually to out of state institutions. In 2017, 18, which is the last year for which we have data, uh, Vermont granted about $5 million that went out of state. And of all, as has been pointed out, here's some uh, details, um, of all of the state money across the United States that students take out of state to attend out of state institutions, almost 42% of that money is just from Vermont. So we have as was pointed out, a very unusual system. And we feel that uh, tax dollars should not be going out of the state, but should be used to support our in-state students and in-state tuition. Our third recommendation is to unify the four institutions of the VSC into a single accreditation institution of public access higher education. So this includes having a common mission but keeping the distinct educational, cultural, and athletic approaches across the campuses. If we have a common mission, we can um, collaborate better. Part of our proposal is to establish uh, what we call system-wide schools to increase access and collaboration and innovation. And I'll show you this in a, in a diagram in a moment. We recommend appointing a president for this Vermont State University who will lead the university with a single executive team. And this executive office will replace the chancellor's office and consolidate the executive teams of the existing institutions. So our vision for this Vermont State University is to have an administrative structure, which is one system, but we keep the campuses as their individual um, with their, their individual brands. So we're looking at consolidating common executive and upper level administrative operations and reducing duplication. So this is what the system might look like. So we would have the three different residential and local community campus hubs. And across the system, we would have schools, each of which would have a dean that would be uh, managing that school. So for example, there might be a school of mathematics, business and engineering across the system that with programs and courses at the different individual institutions. There might be a school of nursing and health sciences. So the idea is that we have an administrative structure that works across the system so that we can use our resources better. And our fourth recommendation has to do with shared governance. So this is to establish a structure for shared system-wide decision-making. 
And our idea is that the fundamental premise of shared governance requires that we have students, staff, faculty, administrators, and trustees all participating in the decision-making process. Shared governance strengthens leadership and decision-making, but it has to have an atmosphere of mutual trust, collaboration, communication, transparency, inclusiveness, honesty, and integrity in order for it to really work. So we're recommending that the Board of Trustees be reconstituted and uh, it should include students, staff, faculty, legislative appointments, and members elected by the Board of Trustees. So this idea of shared governance is the intersection between the governing board that I just uh, it was on the last slide, the administrative team, so the overarching um, uh, administration for the system, and then from the campuses, students and staff, uh, staff and faculty senates as representatives of these other um, stakeholders. So just to wrap this brief presentation up, our idea to unite Vermont is to have a student-centered proposal to unite the system coming from faculty and staff, and we wish to help build an educated and civil society. Vermont um, uh, deserves no less than that. So our four recommendations, just to summarize this, are to increase state appropriations so that we can reduce the currently prohibitive cost of tuition, and this will lead to an increase in enrollment. We suggest redirecting VSAC portability funds and putting that money towards tuition assistance to uh, lower tuition, and this will improve retention and reduce student debt. We recommend unifying the four institutions, including CCV, into a single multi-campus institution managed by one executive team, which can be housed on an existing campus. We don't need an office in Montpelier. And we redirect savings from this to reducing tuition costs as well. And then finally, including faculty and staff on a governing board to assure authentic and effective shared decision-making. So this last slide shows uh, the task force members. I've also um, given this information to um, Jeannie, and so I believe that it might be part of the um, agenda. So you can um, have a look at who we are and where we come from. So I'm going to stop my share here. And um, I don't believe it's my place to ask for questions. So Senator Campion, I, I will turn perfect. this over. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll kick it off. Were you able to share this with the select committee? Um, we have not shared this particular um, PowerPoint presentation, but we have shared the report. Okay, and, and so have you been working in a way with the select committee? Have you had a voice? I mean, I appreciate you coming here. This is great. Uh, the select committee, as you know, has, has a legislative charge and wondering what your connection to that, to their work is or isn't. Um, we don't feel that we have been um, invited to that particular table. Okay. So um, we, we don't think that our recommendations are being um, looked at as much as we would hope they would be. One thing I have noticed though, is that in the various iterations of the NCHEMS report, um, every change that they make does come closer to what we're recommending. So um, there are certainly similarities um, between the programs, the, 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 the recommendations. Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. It's, uh... As a, as a faculty member and former administrator myself, what you have said actually resonates <laughs> very well. I mean, the, the question about um, uh, the, the board of trustees and the governance structure um, is an interesting one. You, uh, it doesn't look like you have any um, outside community members except those who might be appointed by the board itself and that okay so that's accurate and I, so i'm wondering if you 
um, I have to, I have a couple questions, but I'm wondering if you looked at board models um, to help in that uh, sort of in the decision making. Well, I would very much like to turn this over to one of my colleagues because this report was truly a group effort and that is not my particular strong suit. So could one of my colleagues address that question, please? David? Hello, I'm David McGough. I'm a professor at Northern Vermont University. And I'll just say very quickly, yes, we did look at a number of board models to come up with this recommendation. The American Association of University Professors plus the leading board association, Board of Trustees Association, both recommend uh, shared governance models for particularly for public institutions. And about 22% of public institutions provide board seats to faculty and staff members in order to assure state-of-the-art shared uh, decision-making at that level. Um, so those are two points that I would add to answer that question. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, and it's, it's always been my experience that there's, there is an apparent divide between boots on the ground and what faculty uh, understand uh, and then what top level administrators and boards believe is happening. So um, I, I think you said that very clearly. Uh, and, and then one last comment, and I, I know that um, it's also been my experience that a lot of the collaborative experiences do happen through faculty and student interactions across, um, across college, across institutions. So in my own area, I think about our science uh, work and um, Sigma Xi, I don't know if you're still a member of that, but I work very hard on that across all, the whole state. So there are opportunities here, I think, uh, that can bubble up from faculty and students in a very compelling way. So thank you. Uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mango, you mentioned that you would want a collaboration or uh, coming together of the four institutions and the select committee suggests three. Can you just elaborate on why you think CCV should be included as um, part of the state college system and not separate from? Um, well, once again, I'm going to defer to one of my <laughs> group members who is more expert in this. Um, Linda, is that something you would be able to answer, please? Sure, I, I'm Linda Olson. I'm also at Castleton University. I've been a professor of sociology there for 26 years. So Helen beats me, but not by much. So what I would say is we, we thought a, a better model would be if we had only one accreditation for all four institutions, that again would enable us to reduce administrative costs with just one accreditation. But we also thought, um, actually taking the existing residential campuses, opening them up to CCV if they were close, like there's a campus in Rutland that we could merge into Castleton, for example, and we would save on costs that way, but also maintaining the other institutions that are not connected or close to a residential campus. That would enable us to reduce costs as well. One thing that was discussed, and I wanna make sure I make this point because I think it's very important, is that we believe there should be faculty oversight over things such as the curriculum. Um, there is some voluntary, or, or there, I think there's a small stipend paid to the part-time faculty to have this oversight at CCV, but the reality is we would like to incorporate it more into um, the curriculum that faculty, full-time faculty are in charge of. And um, CCV has no full-time faculty. In fact, it is the only community college in the country that has no full-time faculty. That to us is, is disturbing. So while it's held up as the, the ideal model and being agile and nimble and all sorts of other things, it is important to acknowledge that that is done at least in part off of the backs of the part-time faculty that teach there. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hooker, did you have a follow-up before? Oh, thank you. Senator Tarantini. Thank you, Senator Campion. Uh, if I understood correctly, um, this recommendation would uh, 
basically eliminate the individual names of the four institutions or that's not how okay so it, it retains the name of each individual institution yeah one, one thing that we realize is um that uh students attend the, the the residential students certainly they attend a campus they go to a campus for its the the campus uh, let's just call it the brand for want of a better word, but they, they want to attend and graduate from Castleton or NVU Johnson or VTC. Nobody's going to graduate from Vermont State University. That's not what they okay. want. So we have to keep the campus individuality because it's such a strength and we appeal to different students and certainly geographically as well. But no, we have no intention of um, getting rid of the campus names or uh, in uh, identity. Okay, that's that's good because I think just exactly what you said. Somebody goes to Castleton because of it's a brand, you know, or NVU or whatever. So thanks for clearing that up. Yeah. Committee, additional questions. Professor, I uh, my only uh, final comment would be, you know, we are just starting this process, as you know, uh, this is the first time, you know, we've had testimony, but uh, appropriations is also having the same conversations and we are all now looking to February 12th for an additional report. Um, and so I would recommend you have the, a similar conversation with appropriations uh, that you're having with us. Senator Hooker, I'm sure can uh, be helpful with that. Um, and, uh, and stay in touch as we continue to navigate this process. Uh. Well, we certainly will. And that, thank you for that recommendation. We will absolutely follow up on that. And um, I think I would just like to add that we're in the system and we think that's a good thing. And we, we care an awful lot about this. We have this is what I've given my professional life to. I, I believe in public access, higher education. I believe in Castleton individually and in the state college system as a whole. And this is something which is very valuable to the state. And we're, we're trying to help figure out how to make it better. So that, that's our goal. It's a student centered. We're trying to make it better for the students and for the state. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your partnership. It, it's, I think it's something we all believe in it's it it is in part the times that we're living in some of the challenges that are external in other words financial things that are happening in other states in terms of as we mentioned admissions uh how can we you know again keep what we have uh, and make certain or some variation of it and make certain that it continues to thrive and serve vermonters so uh your ideas are certainly welcome and uh, we were pleased that you were able to come in and talk with us for a little while today. Well, we're very grateful. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Committee. Uh, so it looks like um, we are finished or soon will be for the day. Uh, it, uh, tomorrow we are going to continue our look at education at uh, financing. Um, and then we are going to hear from our ledge council so that uh, everybody is um, aware of a few policies and updates as they relate to uh, Act 46, which some of us were here for, uh, others were not. Um, uh, we know that a court case was just decided around uh, religious uh, institutions and dual enrollment. We're going to hear an update and help us to understand that. Uh, as well as just a brief overview for a few new folks of what the Brigham decision was and how it impacts uh, the state of Vermont. Um, as you know, as I mentioned, uh, we have asked Jeff Fannin to organize our other educational partners to come up with a plan for what the state is going to need uh, to address immediate COVID needs, as well as uh, going forward when we're looking at remediation, et cetera. He is planning on coming back to this committee a week from today with a report, and who will also, uh, I think that report will also be shared with appropriations. I'm sure uh, parts of it will overlap with health and welfare. I'm sure they're gonna also have their own 
look at schools and trauma and things like that. Um, and there might be some overlap there. Uh, that is expected again next Tuesday. I did ask um, uh, Senator McCormick to come in with his bill uh, the day after the presidential inauguration uh, to come in and, and introduce civic education, his bill, as well as hear an update from the Agency of Education or give us some information on what is happening in this state as it relates to civic education um, and educating for democracy. You know, what are the standards? Where does it happen pre-K through 12? Just to give us a sense of things. And then I've asked a few other uh, people to come in and kind of get us thinking about, uh, you know, more about civic education, what certain uh, things are happening throughout the United States, uh, some of their ideas, again, to get young people uh, engaged in the demo this democracy um, and, uh, We'll see what, what sort of comes out of that. Next week, we'll have more bill introductions. Um, and for new uh, senators, usually what we do is we have every sponsor come in and basically explain the genesis of why they put the bill in. You know, this is this is what I believe. So Senator McCormick will come in and talk about why he thought a, requiring a class in civic education was important. And then if it need be, we'll have our uh, ledge council talk through the bill. This isn't particularly, although it's, it's important, it's uh, not a particularly challenging bill to understand. So ledge council won't do that. And we take some testimony and then we'll sort of have a committee assessment to see where people might wanna go with a particular bill um, if there's interest, et cetera. So we'll hear, in the end, we'll hear from everybody uh, that puts a bill in and we'll really kick this off Thursday, but we'll do much more of it um, next week. Um, questions, comments? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. I hope everybody's doing well. Staying Thank safe. you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I thought today was interesting, uh, challenging, and uh, looking forward to continuing to, uh, to work with folks on this. So, okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody.